It's all the song. Ooh. Can we turn that down a little bit? Turn my mic down, please. Okay. The song we sang this morning, Is It Well With Your Soul? It reminds me of this story I was told, and I think that I wish I would have put it in practice, and I think we should, but it would be very awkward. For example, if you were to come in this morning and you walk up to me, can we turn it down just a little bit more on my mic? If, if I was to walk up to you, instead of saying, you know, what we usually do, we say, well, good morning, how are you doing? If someone was to walk up to you and say, good morning, how is your soul? And that came from a man who was telling me there was an elder at their church that whenever he would come in, that he would walk up and say, good morning, how are you doing? And he said, it is good, it is well, how is, how is your soul? And that just like rips to the core of you, doesn't it? I mean, because you say, well, you don't really expect an answer, do you? You know, when you think about it, you go, good morning, how are you doing? Oh, man, I couldn't sleep last night. I woke up with a headache. And then uh, this happened at my work. And then, okay, thank, thank, okay. Too much information. But how is it with your soul? That song is one of the most beautiful songs. And it was written by a man who had lost his family in a transatlantic ship that sank. And when the family was, when he and the other survivors, surviving family members, you know, they, they traveled out to the point where that ship had sank and all the family members that survived were there on this ship at that spot where they had lost, he had lost his family. He wrote that song. And to me, that is goosebumps. It just gives me goosebumps to think that in that moment of his life, the worst moment you can think of, and it's not just the worst moment, it's like being at the grave of your loved one and then to say, it is well with my soul. To come up with something like that and talking about peace that overflows us. I want something like that. That's what I hope that I can achieve. And I think everyone does. Because when we look at What's going on around us in our lives, and, and especially right now, um, at least for me personally, the past couple of months has been rough. I had a first cousin that I grew up with when real little, real close with, pass away, and we had her memorial here. And then last week, one of my favorite aunt and uncle, my aunt, passed away, and I'm going to be going to Phoenix to perform that service. <clears throat> And I look at the number, and I started looking at my file for funerals. And it's huge. Over 25 different funerals and memorial services. And so I couldn't help but start to think. And then last night, Crystal's grandfather passed away. And the day before that, her, uh, her uncle had passed away. This last week... Marlene Stewart passed away. It was a dear friend of mine's mom and a beautiful Christian from the other Church of Christ, Miranda Street Church of Christ. It just doesn't seem to stop. Like you want it to stop, don't you? You know, you think about it and it's like, just stop dying, people. You know, if anyone could just stop for a moment. But that doesn't happen. When I was 19, I lost my dad. Somebody asked me, they said, well, they asked me the stupidest question, and I got really angry, but I was pretty angry about a lot of things at 19. How did you handle it? Like, what do you mean, how do I handle it? How do you handle it? And I was a Christian. Supposedly, you know, I'd been baptized. I mean, I was a Christian. I was going to church here. The congregation here took care of my family. The preacher who was preaching at that time performed the services for my father. And I thought, what a full circle. I am who I am today because of all the parts that have come to play that pulls together. Some of those parts I don't like, you know. It's kind of like 
not buying genuine Chevy parts and putting it in and taking a risk because you go, well, you know what, I can't afford the genuine Ford you know, Motorcraft, so I'll go ahead and buy the Checker Auto one and just pray that it works. And then it blows up and causes all sorts of other damage and collateral. All the other parts start to be affected because you bought that cheap oil which burnt the rings, which then caused... That's my life. <laughs> but I can't stop it. It's too late. I am who I am because of all those parts. And so are you. Now, if we could have avoided that tree in the garden and eaten the fruit, then I wouldn't have this catastrophe of life. But wait a minute. You know, it wasn't God's fault. We try to blame God, but it's not God's fault. All those damaged parts and all that I am make me better and make me weaker. But the most leveling part of it is that it humbles you. I love to watch the energy and the, the tenaciousness of 20-year-olds and 25-year-olds and 30-year-olds who know everything. And that's great because without that, you wouldn't move forward. We need you. I'm not knocking it. Because without that, that tenaciousness that you have and that vigor, the life is going to kick the breath out of you. It's not F, you know. It's not like somebody say, well, you might get thrown off a bull. Well, not if I don't ride bulls. Well, guess what? Life is a bull. And so as I looked at all this, and now I'm preparing to do another memorial service for a very beloved family member, and I'm thinking about her, and I'm thinking about all the engagements that I've had with them, and that's what I always do. No matter who it's been, over all the 20 years of doing these services, I, I look, and what's the connection? And some I've had no connection. And in others I've had them. But I, try, I, I do that. And so as I was looking at that, I started thinking of those parts. And you know what? I thought of math. And I thought of parts. I started thinking of math. And I do not like math. Praise God for calculators. Because <laughs> even when I went to college, we could take a calculator in doing algebra, you know. But there's a lot of similarities to it. I mean, you know, they say math, honestly. Math is an amazing language. It's a language. It communicates. It has solved things. I mean, again, I mean, I can like something and respect it and not really be able to comprehend it. But, oh man, if you look at the ratios and things that math does and how it can solve things. And I love that scene in Apollo 13 where you got these guys barreling towards the moon and they pull out these little things on sticks and start moving it up and down when they're trying to verify this intricate math solution to make sure that they're on the right direction and it's a thing called a slide ruler <laughs> and that's that's me with my life but see I, I don't know how to use a slide ruler and that's what it feels like but there has to be something right so who are you? What are your parts? You know, Aristotle said this, and this is what came to my mind too, is he says the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So as soon as I was thinking about all these parts and formulas and stuff, I started thinking about, well, Aristotle, or what are you talking about? You know, I know he's, he's not biblical, but I started thinking about it. I thought, he's right. My life... What I am right now is still greater than all those parts. For better or for worse, it's what I am. The issue that we have to contend with, though, is that life, you know, when we say solve for a certain formula, you know, solve for X, is that every one of those are variables. They're not constants. It's not that X is always going to be 5. And so every time you see an X, you can throw a 5 in there. Every time somebody dies, I can just throw a 5 in there. Every time I have a problem with a family member, when every time I struggle to, to try to think right, that I can just throw a constant in that formula and bam! Every time it'll work. 
I can't pull up a calculator that has a formula in there that says life. Okay, let's see. Here it is. Here, oh, yeah, there's the button there. Financial problems. Beep. And even if I had used it before, the variable will change, won't it? Because now the financial problem is different. The person I'm having conflict is different. The person who died is different. Everything keeps happening. And sometimes I choose well, like Indiana Jones, the movie, you know. And sometimes we choose poorly. So to me, it, it, it is like life we're always trying to solve for X. And I've always wondered, who is the first person to come up with this? You know, I mean, the, that, that's a great mind in itself. Mixing letters and numbers, you know, but that's a wisdom beyond me. But it's also the way God is when it comes to our lives and our solving for X. It's a wisdom beyond us. It's something that I don't know. But you know what? I don't have to understand the formula. I just know how to use it. I don't have to know the origin, I mean. It doesn't matter what the origin is. I know that somebody smarter than me knows how. That it works. And so that's what we look at. Years and years and years ago, though, see, this is a part of it, too. I saw this poster. I tried to recreate it. But it was an orangutan sitting there all disgusted, and he's laying back, and he says, just when I got all the answers right, they changed the questions. Isn't that your life? And I, I really have that expression just like that, you know, sometimes. But there's got to be something here that we can look at. Somehow we, we, you know, I mean, because we're better than that. And there is, though. And there's one person that I want us to look at because you talk, <laughs> you talk about a guy who struggled. You talk about somebody who had it all solved. He had X, and it was a constant. He had zeal, and he drove after it. He was loving of God like no one else. And his world blew apart. Just put yourself in Paul's position on that road to Damascus. He had it together. He was probably around 30 years of age. He was one of the most intelligent Pharisees that was around. And they trusted him. The council it trusted him and gave him power. He trained at Gamaliel's feet. He's like going, to, he's like, you know, the Rhodes Scholar of today. He's like the one who graduated honors cum laude at, at Princeton and Yale and Harvard. That's Paul. When you come out after being educated like that, you've got to drive. You know you're confident about yourself. And nothing can sway you from that. Until Jesus comes in your life. And that's what happened to Paul. In all the parts that were moving in his life. His upbringing in Tarsus. You know, his citizenship as a Roman. His training and in fine education with Gamaliel. Changed its value. In a blinding light. On a road to Damascus. The whole of Paul would never be the same. But the whole of Paul is what empowered him as well, right? With all the things that he has. And I love what Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 4 through 6. And he talks about himself, and that's one of the things I love. We're going to get to Corinthians, is that there was a part of him that is so damaged, it was almost like he didn't want to talk about it. Because it was such a foreign thought to him of who he used to be that it's like, I don't want to bring that up, but okay, if you want to, I can throw some stuff out here. You want to talk about somebody who had something, somebody who was important in the world's eyes, nobody can top me. The rest of them are fishermen. All the other Christians and the people who are following, I'm smarter than they are. I've experienced more. And so in 3 of Philippians, he says, if somebody thinks that they have reasons in, to put confidence in the flesh... I have more circumcised the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, 
faultless. I was faultless. Now think about that. Were you really, Paul? Until that blinding light, every part that made the whole of Paul was perfect. Until Jesus came into his life. And then everything that he had done to that point was for what? Over in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul says he suffered. His whole wasn't so whole. There was a problem with all that he had done, all that he thought was so faultless that the new person that he was had some residual effects on him. And he says, and starting in 12, he says, Or because of these surpassing great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan, to torment me. He prayed three times to fix that broken part of his whole. That he would be a better whole. That he would be better at who he was if the Lord would just take that away. Nobody knows what that thorn is. And it doesn't matter. You have them. Don't you? We all have them. And they're always there. Like those goat heads in my backyard. No matter how much I pull them. We have a bunch of them back there, man. And I have spent so much money. You're, la you're right, huh? Some of you know what I mean. That's what it's like. Try to get rid of those goat heads in your life. And you'd be praying. If it would have affected you every time you walked out and you were barefoot and every time you tried to do something, that it poked and poked. It was constantly there. Imagine a man who was responsible for the death of Christians. That every time he opened his mouth to speak about the gospel and salvation and the need for forgiveness of sin, and every person that he submerged and baptized and brought up, he thought, how many have I killed? been responsible for the death of. Every time he'd see a beautiful Christian family, I think he could not help but flash back to the time that he drug a family out and put them in jail. Haunting. And he was one of the worst apostles, wasn't he? No. A thorn in my flesh. What's your thorn? You, you know it's there. You know, a lot of times we feel the residual pain from it, but identifying it sometimes is a harder trick, isn't it? But again, it's the point that they're there, that our parts are doing that. A life of suffering that he endured. <laughs> you know, in the world, Paul was whole and solid and prosperous and happy in his career path. When he became a Christian and Jesus came in his life and blew all the value out of everything he had accomplished, did it get better? No. <laughs> it didn't get better. Ron, wait a minute. You've got to have a little bit of an encouraging word in here. What are you, where are you going with this? I mean, come on. You're getting worse with this, pro this story. When you said that he saw Jesus on the road and he was saved and he was baptized, life should have just got wonderful. It didn't. It got worse. It got really bad. In 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 29 I have worked much harder. I have been in prison more frequently. I have been flogged more severely. And have been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open ocean. See, I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, 
in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches who is weak. And I do not feel weak who is led to sin. And I do not inwardly burn. You think that I've accomplished it? Look what I've done. Look what I've suffered. There was no aspect, no moving part that was kind to him. And when the Lord, when he prayed to the Lord to take that thorn away, what did he say? No, Paul. No. Because it's through your weaknesses that I will make you strong. Hmm. Now we're starting to come around. Now we're starting to see something. But he had to reach a point to where he could see that the whole, what he accumulated in life, had reached a point of worthlessness. So in 8 and 9, back over in Philippians, Paul says, Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing... Oh, there we go. Look at this. I found everything a loss of surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. So you gave everything up. Prestige. Your education. What was all that education for, Paul? What did all that that you worked to be to age 30, did all of a sudden, that you gave it all up? You know, when I started preaching, I was 30 years old. And I had a good job. I love my job. I was doing well. And when I, when I decided to start preaching, I had people come up to me and say, what are you doing? Christians! One phone call I got was weeping. Saying, I know what they go through. And I know what you're going to experience. And I don't want that for your family. <laughs> I was so shocked. I, I would, I, to this day, I'm still shocked. But they're not wrong. They're not wrong. You look around, and I look around at preachers, and I see their lives, and people who are spiritual leaders. Not just preachers, but spiritual warriors who have stood up for the truth. And it hasn't gone well, necessarily, for them. But I have always been taken care of. I have always been provided for. And I have to, I'm sorry, but my faith is run by the rearview mirror sometimes. In other words, I have to look in the rearview mirror to see how blessed I am. And I bet you are too. There's no shame in that. But use your rearview mirror for your faith and look and see how great He has been providing for you and how good it is. But you see, this is the passage that I came to, that I, that I thought about and thought and thought, you know, all that I had gained, all that I had come towards and what put me together, all the little things that I had accomplished, the things that I could nail a certificate on a wall. I thought, but what about eternity? What about immortalness that I want? What is that thing that my grandfather had who didn't even have a high school education, but loved God so much with all his heart and all his soul. What, what did I saw in him all the suffering and yet all the peace and beauty that he had in his life. Those examples are around you. And maybe you've got to use that faith of rearview mirror and look. Look at them. Look back. We've had many here. Just amazing. Jesus used... Paul's worthless life. And he will use ours. Look what Paul says in Timothy. 
1 Timothy 15 and 16. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. I, I, he said, Jesus Christ came into this world for the sinners of whom I am the worst. And he's not saying that to brag or to try to express some great humility. Oh, look at me, I'm so humble. See, I'm the worst sinner. No, his heart broke when he thought about what he did. You can't hurt people any more than what I've done. You couldn't do more harm to Christ and his beloved ones. When Stephen was being stoned, Paul was there endorsing it and glorifying himself in the name of God for committing this great justice against this blasphemer. And there was Stephen. As he's being stoned, looks up in the heavens and he sees Jesus standing there. And then he looks and he says, Lord, don't hold them accountable for they do not know what they're doing. You think Paul didn't hear a little of that from time to time as he was touching lives and then he would flash back. You talk about PTSD, spiritual PTSD and thinking while he's talking about the greatness of Christ and all of a sudden hearing those stones thump on Stephen and Stephen while he's being pounded to death and bleeding and suffering he says and he looks out at the crowd and I'm sure that caught his attention because he was angry about him claiming that God was on his side and when he said I see Jesus standing up there he probably turned and what and was probably enjoying this execution when he said Lord, don't hold them accountable. But it didn't phase him then, did it? See, there's things like that in your life right now that are sitting there. Just sitting there waiting for the opportunity for Christ to take that worseness in you that you have done. And if he could do it in Paul, he can do it in everyone. And that's what he says. Do you remember another thing that happened during his conversion? That when Ananias said, was directed by Jesus, he said, hey, go to Damascus. There's this guy named Saul in the, on the straight street. And all I, Ananias go, whoa, wait a minute. No, 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 no. no that, that guy is killing people and he's arresting people. And what did the Lord tell him? Don't worry about it. I have shown him what he is going to suffer. Who would sign up for that? I mean, if you really knew what you were going to go through in basic training, I mean, the glorious posters are awesome, right? But when you're in the middle of it in shark attack, when the drill sergeants are just pounding on you, and when you're getting hurt and you're getting suffering and all that, if you really had experienced it and knew exactly what was going to happen, would your decision be the same? And yet, Paul saw all of it. The Lord showed him every beating, every shipwreck. Every time he was going to be naked, every time he was going to be in prison. But he saw something bigger, didn't he? You have to. You have to go beyond those things to grasp the greatness of it. And he got it <laughs> in his blindness and exposed like nothing before. He still chose Jesus as God's son over all the things he'd accomplished and all as damaged as he was he knew there was one thing that was going to be the blood of Christ that same blood that was going to make him whole Jesus used him and that example did have power at first it kind of worked against him because people were afraid of him. Matter of fact, you know, if you'll recall, you know, when he went back to Jerusalem after he had been converted and become a Christian and he wanted to meet with the other disciples, they would have nothing to do with him. They're like, are you crazy? This is a, this is a scam. <laughs> he 
He's just trying to draw us out in the open. He's got a bunch of temple guards surrounding in the bushes, and he's going to have us come out and talk to him saying, he's a Christian. <laughs> and it was Barnabas, the encourager, the one who went back and said, no, 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 you no, he's, he's the real deal. He is, he is completely turned. But people didn't want to have anything to do with him. He was that oddball apostle, he even says himself. An apostle who was born out of due season. The other 12 had legitimacy to the Jews, to the Jewish Christians. He, they, those guys lived with him, walked with him, ate with him, suffered with him. They saw with their own eyes the miracles. Then there's Paul. And he says, nobody worked harder than me. I know who I am, and I know my value is nothing. And I am very broken, and I have thorns all over me. We're the same way. That's it. It's not, you know, sometimes when I read these Bible characters, they're really hard for me to relate to. You see, because they made the book, I didn't. <laughs> and if you made the book, the Bible... You had to be good. You, you had something that God could use, not me. I, I've just never been able to relate. I look at Joseph. I look at Moses. I look at Aaron. I look at all of them, and I go, I would, I would have been the guy that you never knew the name about. <laughs> Whenever Moses went up to the mountain, I'd be that Yahoo off somewhere else. You know, that would be me. That, I, I'm, I'm not that. So every time I would hear these characters, Jonah, even Jonah, you know, I, I just thought, there's no way, not me. And, I started, and as I started looking at Paul, I started to think, why not? Why not me? Why not you? It's just because he'd run out of paper, putting us all in it. There wouldn't be enough trees in the world. It's just that he used some to help us. And he did. He took one of the most broken people that you could imagine and made him one of the most glorious servants of his so that you and I today could look at it and relate. Not to push back, but to relate. That if the power of the blood of Jesus Christ can do that for him, imagine what it can do for you if you let it. All your broken parts coming together. The psalmist cries out in 38. For my iniquities have gone over my head. Like a burden, <clears throat> they are too heavy for me. My wounds sink and fester because of my foolishness. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate. All of the day I go about mourning. For my sides are filled with burning. And there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult that's in my heart. You ever had one of those days? That's what I love about the Psalms. That's why I'm going through them. I'm going to put a shameless plug in for this afternoon. But I've been doing the Psalms and I just started this afternoon. I'm excited to get started on it. If we didn't have to break for lunch, I would just jump right into it. But this Psalm here is me. It's you. But you see, if you're a chronic, and a, in a chronic condition of sin, it's like a chronic illness. You, you, you forget to know what it's like to be well. If you've ever had a cold or a, a, a health problem for an extended period, two to three weeks, and then all of a sudden you get well, it's almost like, man, I ought to get sick more often because, man, I feel fantastic now. That is salvation. You see, we live in a chronic state of sin. And that becomes our baseline. That becomes what's normal to us. And we forget about how beautiful and wonderful it is when we're mended and whole through that blood. Paul says in Romans, after he talked about himself, he said, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. That's our starting point. That's our starting point. 
Doesn't matter who we are. And Paul goes on in 22 and 23. He says in chapter 3, There is no distinction, for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. No matter how righteous you think you are, you're still broke. Look at Paul. See, go right back to him. He, he was the most righteous you could imagine under the Mosaic law. But that wasn't good enough. That wasn't the solution. And it was a hard learn for him to figure that out, wasn't it? So what can make us whole? I've been saying it. We've been seeing it. But see, this is going to difference. This is going to help you to discern how you are filtering priorities in your life. Have you heard it? Have you picked up on the things that I've been saying? Because a yearning heart will see it. You're there. Maybe you're still the Paul that's standing outside watching Stephen being stoned to death and the righteous being assaulted. And you're okay with that. Maybe that's you this morning as you listen to this lesson. And you didn't hear the answer or perceive it because you're not ready yet. You're still searching. It starts with this, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. That is the most memorized scripture and the most misunderstood one you see because that love there is not because he liked you it's not because he had a warm fuzzy when he thought of ron herring or when he thought of you oh i love him Mm -mm. (laughs) that's not this love that god had so much of it's agape Wanting the best for you, in spite of you, against you sometimes. And it wasn't going to stop him. And it didn't stop him, did it? And so in sending his son so that nobody should perish, he didn't want him to perish, but he understood there were going to be some that would. You see, because go back to the tree in the garden. There was a choice to be made. And we chose poorly. This morning, there's a choice to be made. Whether you're a Christian or not, always we have a choice. And that's what this is talking about. In spite of the love that God has demonstrated through His Son, some may still perish. But it's not because of Him. It's not because you're so broken that you couldn't receive redemption wasn't there. First Peter says it beautifully in 2, 24 and 25. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been made, you have been healed, for you were strained like sheep. There's our condition. But now have turned, returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Have you Have you? And like sheep, even though you may have been there once, you can wander off. And the wandering off, you may wake up in another pasture. That's the problem. Sometimes that sheep has got his head down and he's just eating grass and he's following the greener grass that he thinks. And he just keeps eating it and he keeps going and he keeps going. And also you look, uh uh-oh. Oops. (laughs) That's the way we are sometimes spiritually, isn't it? We just kind of get into a groove of life and we just kind of, as Christians, and then also we wake up and go, oh man, life is bad. What happened? What pastor am I in? Look for the shepherd. There's only one. There's only one. Isaiah. Over 500 years discussed this and drew it out. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him, the chastisement that brought us what? Peace. That is the perfect peace. That is where he gets the title, Prince of Peace. 
But the world was confused when he came. When he came into Jerusalem that week that he was going to die on that donkey and people were waving and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. They thought that peace, the Prince of Peace was coming. That finally the Romans would leave. See, that's your problem too is what do you, how do you define words? You know, when you're talking to somebody that doesn't necessarily share the same language or lingo, like if I was to go to Louisiana or go up to the East Coast somewhere and somebody was to use a certain word, you know, sometimes I have to stop and say, how do you define that? How do you use that? Because where I come from, that means something else. Even in New Mexico, Spanish, from the south to the north. There's a word they will use up north, coyote. It means something different when you say coyote down south and you're talking about, right? So when I say peace, and when he said peace, what does it mean to you? So when Paul says that he obtained all peace that surpasses understanding, that nobody can get it, I kept looking for the magical pill. I kept waiting for the magical scripture, and I kept looking. I go, how did he get it? He's sitting in prison. It was in the blood. It was exactly what Isaiah said. The chastisement was laid upon him. He was pierced so that we could be made whole, so that he could bring us peace. That's the only place that you gain true peace. This world is going to stay the same. I don't care how great an ambassador you are. You know, middle children are supposed to be the negotiators. I'm a middle child, you know, and I used to be really good at it. But I couldn't fix it all. No way in my family, no matter how good I tried. No matter how good I've tried when I've been brought into problems in people's lives. There's no peace in this world. It just isn't going to happen. Well, as long as the, Satan is present and evil is around us. But there's something that surpasses that. Like Paul said, and it's in the blood of Christ. The Hebrew writer says as well, talking about this permanent solution that we can find in Hebrews 9.28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. That's a hope. coming back around, talking about all the people that we've seen lost. That's what I think about. What do they have to hope for? You know, when it's all over. We've seen it all around us. Death is not going to stop. It's not going to slow down because you're having a bad day. It's not going to slow down because you've lost two people in your life and that's enough. Or they come in threes. No. It will keep coming at us. And it will keep coming at us. So you've got to ask the question, what am I really looking forward to? I'm looking forward to this time that He's going to save me once and for all and final. Psalms 49. The psalmist says, People despite their wealth do not endure. They, like the beast, perish. This is the fate of those who trust in themselves and of their followers who approve their sayings, they are like sheep and are all destined to die. God, it's depressing. Only if you don't have Christ. When I was spiritually a child, I'd read that and get so depressed. I was like, oh, great, I'm just a sheep, huh? But I had to remember, wait a minute, I'm not. Because I have Christ. You have Christ. He goes on and says, Death will be their shepherd, but the upright will prevail over them in mourning. Their forms will decay in the grave, far from the princely mansions. But God will redeem me from the realm of the dead. He will surely take me to Himself. That's the place we should strive for. That's why Paul could look at everything that he had and realize what rubbish compared to what I gain in Christ in the resurrection. Remember, that's what he was saying. 
He said, you know, everything that I've accomplished, I count as rubbish because I see the resurrection. I see the resurrection and the beauty of what I want in there. God will redeem me from the dead. Will he you? Because that's what it's about. It's about you. It's not about us. It's not about your bros. It's about you and him. I will not be there on the other side when you die. There will be no welcoming committee of your buddies. You will be as naked as you could be and spiritually exposed. But God will be there, rest assured. He will be there. Life is a sum of our parts, but the whole, like Aristotle said, is greater. No matter how imperfect those parts are that you have, that is exactly what makes you perfect with the blood of Christ. I used to think when I started preaching, because I started, I'd get up here and I, I'm telling you, I, I would stand behind here. I was so scared. And we had this overhead projector. And I'd stand here. And there was a, there was a wing nut on this platform we had for the overhead projector. You, you remember those? Check Facebook. It'll probably ask you. If you know what that is, you're old. And, and I would twist that thing. I, was so, I would just grip like a death grip. And I, and I would leave. And after Monday morning, I would sit there and I'd go in my office and I'd go, What am I doing? I said, God, why don't you have angels do this job? Because I can't. And I don't know. My own little voice or maybe the God helping me. But I realized, I thought, where do angels sleep? Where do they lay their head down at night? Where do you and I lay our heads down at night? Who better can tell the story than somebody that is so damaged as all of us? And when we can look at a Paul and we can look at each other and see the power of the blood of Christ, you're perfect for the kingdom. That's how that kingdom went from a few thousand to the world and has never stopped. Never stopped. No matter how much nations and evil has tried to stop, never has stopped it, cannot stop it, and was prophesied that way by Daniel when God said, no one will ever touch that last kingdom. That's where we're at. So take a look at yourself. This is your moment. To evaluate how you were with God. Okay, you got some bad parts inside. You've got some bad experiences. You've got some sin that maybe shame you to no end. But remember, Paul. Remember, just because I stand up here now and I look nice and, you know, whatever you may think, I'm as broken as you are. I am. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> But he does know. And, and I think that a lot of my brokenness has really helped me. And I know I would rather listen to somebody that has experienced it like yourselves than somebody who has never has no idea what it's like. Like our politicians in Washington, right? When I hear them talk, I just cringe. Oh, I know what it's like. I'm going to come down there and we're going to, we, I know what it's like. And it's like, dude, you've always made 100000 a year. What are you talking about? You know what it's like to live on food stamps? You know what, how humiliating it is when you got a car that can't make it? They can't relate. But you see, Jesus uses us because we can relate to one another. And that's the power of the gospel. And that's the power of attraction. Because we know we have something in the resurrection. And that's what I want to share with you if you have not taking the time to become a Christian by being baptized and having your sins 
washed. And if you're a Christian is woke up, wake up. If you're in the wrong pasture, come back to the true shepherd. Think about these things while we stand and we sing.